Welcome. I'm Alan Cohen, and this is the Quarantine Interviews. Today, I have a really special guest for us. He's a drummer and percussionist, well-known, well-sought-after on the New York scene. He plays in many, many Broadway shows, recordings, and freelances around town. He's played for Tarzan, Wicked, Aida, Billy Ellie, and Cirque du Soleil. Uh, I like to say hello to Gary Selickson. Hey, Gary, how are you today? Hey, Alan, how are you? Thanks for having me here, man. Oh, man, my pleasure, my pleasure. Really good to see you. It's nice. We're in your home studio, I guess? This is my home studio. It's a little little house out in the back of my uh, property here. Oh, yeah? Oh, oh, it's be, it's off the uh, the main house. Yeah, it's, just, it's like about a 10-minute, uh, not 10-minute, about a 10-yard, 20-yard walk. Oh, that's cool. So you, you have some privacy to really rock it out. And it's great. Yeah, I couldn't do it in the house because I would blow the walls down. <laughs> how, how long have you been in that studio uh, i mean uh, this studio we, we've been in the house since 2010 so the studio about 2011 right great. yeah nine years it's right. been great the ceilings are high and it, you know the walls are non-parallel like vaulted ceiling you showed me before right. great for the sound and you do a lot of recording there as well i see the mics all set up right do some show. teaching i do a bunch of recording whenever anybody asks me to do it i can do file sharing you know all of that. It's, it's been so, a great space. So you must have been doing that. Uh, actually, you know, obviously our conversation is going to end up going towards uh, what's going on with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and how we're all trapped in a house. Doesn't look like you're trapped so bad, but it looks like you've been recording a lot before from your home studio also, right? Absolutely. It's been beautiful. Right, so we'll get to that. Um, so I, I know you. I, I know you from these Broadway shows. I, I was able to sub on a couple of the shows that you were on. Uh, maybe Wicked or Tarzan, or, or one, one of those. I, I think or Billy Elliot. I think, but um, you know, for some of the guitars, JJ McGeehan at the time. And yeah, right. You, JJ. You yeah, quite a bit. in a while. Good, good friend of mine. So anyway, really, how did you start? What was your career beginning? Uh, obviously, uh, you know, how did you start in the in in the business and or, or really sure. how did you start playing at all? Sure. Well, I'm in South Orange, New Jersey now. And uh, when I was a kid, I took I, for whatever reason, I always loved the drums. And I, I found a teacher kind of luckily, this guy in West Orange, his name is Glenn Weber, and he really uh, set me up beautifully through for many years, um, all the way up, you know, I did the all city, I mean, the uh, all state competitions and things. And then when I got more serious, and I realized that a conservatory music school is an option, he prepared me for that. So uh, from there, I went to, I got in uh, at Hart School of Music, and there was a gentleman there named Alexander Leepak, who is a fantastic composer, great teacher. He's actually Jeff Procaro's godfather, if you really? believe that. Yeah, the friendly with the Procaros and the, a lot of the LA session guys are ex Leapak students. Oh, so, made, so from Hart, but Hart's in, in, in uh, Connecticut. Hart, right? Yeah, Hart is in Hartford. And what happened was Emil Richards, the great vibist was on tour and percussionist was on tour with George Shearing yeah. in the 50s when Hollywood was just beginning and Emil was there with the trio and they were in LA for a little while and, and somebody tipped them off and said you know this this film business TV film business is just starting and really a guy like you could do very well here so Emil Richards moved there immediately tried to get my teacher Leepak there all throughout Leepak's career it happened a little bit on and off but uh, Emil Richards spawned um, you know, he was wildly successful as a percussionist, mallet player, everything. Did a billion films and a lot of TV, Mission Impossible, and all kinds of things. He had a rental business. He, he amassed a lot of world percussion. He would take these trips around the world just to gather percussion instruments. And then he'd come back to L.A. and he'd call up the composers who were using him on the films and say, Hey, look, come on. I want you to come over and listen to this instrument. I just brought over from Zaire and it would be a, you know, an African balafon or something. Uh -huh. And then he'd take a trip out East to Asia and bring back some Asian percussion that's never been heard before. So as a result of all this, he was, Emil Richards was able to rent the gear to the studios for the films. He was able to play on all this stuff. You, you never know when you need something yeah, he, struggles, right? I'm sorry. 
You never know when you need something from the jungles and the. No, I mean, so it kept. You know, he he had like a he had an instant connection there. The composers loved him because it had all these wild sounds. So he had a tremendous career, and he tried to get Lee Pack, my teacher at heart. They were best friends, mm -hmm. uh, out there forever. But the, my point of all this is that Lee Pack, a lot of Lee Pack students, a little older than me, went to L.A. and were film guys and TV guys. Right. Bob Zamitti and and a lot of other people, Judy Chilnick. Um, and, uh, so when I stumbled upon Hart School of Music as a kid, it was really mind blowing to me that suddenly this guy, who is Jeff Brokaw's godfather and so all that. Actually his godfather, I thought you meant Actually his godfather, because he and Jeff's father, Joe, were oh, really? tight and Emil Richards, the three of them, there was like a triumvirate from Hartford. Uh, they all, we all, they all played in the Hartford Symphony together, and Emil Richards was successful in getting Jeff Percaro's father, Joe Percaro, out to L.A. And, uh, and Joe Percaro, Jeff's father, had a huge career with Emil in L.A. as a studio guy. They never were successful with Lee Pack because Lee Pack was ensconced in the Hartford scene. He had a bunch of kids. He had like, literally had 10 kids. And as every time he was asked to go over there, his wife, Charlotte, would say, there's no way you were leaving Hartford. You have a job at the symphony, you have a job at the college. You can't, we just can't up and move to LA. I'm pregnant with number five, number six. So he never went out there. But the point of my story is I was completely inspired by this guy and he was an amazing teacher. You know, he opened up the world like, wow, look at this. Some of his students are in LA and some of his students are in New York doing stuff. So it was great. So that, uh, I went to school there, that was five years. And then after that, I had to figure out- what Study percussion. Studied, per yeah, percussion and drums. He was a great drummer, too. I right. played a lot of big band stuff, which I think really prepared me for sure. the Broadway scene because I, could, I was comfortable playing with a big band. I knew how to do that really well. Right. Um, anyway, so I thought about going to L.A. or New York, and I decided on New York because I loved jazz at the time a lot. But your family's from, from our... Family, yeah, my family is from West Orange by way of Germany. Oh, yeah. So it was good that, that you stayed on this coast. I guess <laughs> your parents love that, but you could have went. Yeah. I mean, it certainly worked out well. I was unfortunate. I, I've had a career that's, you know, been very, uh, pretty, exactly. steady, pretty steady for years here. And Broadway, as it turned out, was something well suited for me because I had done a lot of big band. I played a lot of percussion. So if, the, you know, whatever style the music was in, I felt pretty at home with. And if they wanted me to play some percussion or whatever it was, that was just, it didn't bother me at all. Right. So what, what was really your first scene in getting into the scene of Broadway? It's a, it's a good story. Actually, I'll be brief. Uh, uh, so when I came here, um, right before I decided to come to New York, I read an interview with Gary Chester. Now you might know who Gary Chester is, Al. His son, his son was an engineer at the old Edison studios. Okay, I know the studio. In the, in the, in the hotel, but his, he himself, Gary, was a studio drummer that did all the Bacharach and David stuff. And he's on the Monkees recordings and yeah. he did a bunch of work. John Denver. I was mean, it really was, Mickey Dolan's playing the drums? What do you mean? No, 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 not at all. That was Gary Chester for a lot of it. So, and he had just started teaching a lot and uh, he had a very unique way of teaching. And, and so I read this interview with this guy who was very eccentric and he said he was teaching and he was had a massive studio career as a session drummer. Yeah. And this is in the time just around you know like in the mid 80s when Steve Gadd had really taken hold of the industry so I was all about becoming the next Steve Gadd I thought or you know I wanted to be I figured I could be a studio guy because Gadd right just turned 75 yeah 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 amazing yeah anyway so Gary Chester was like it seemed like if I study with with this guy it might be a way into the New York session scene right and right. I thought so, but of course it was the mid eighties and drum machines were running rampant everywhere. And there weren't, was not that much live mm. studio work at that time for drummers. It was really dwindling. Everybody, the jingle scene, everybody turned to the machines. And so my timing was not good as far as that was concerned. However, one of his students was uh, Howard Joins, Howie Joins. Oh. And Gary Chester said to me one day, he said, you know, have you ever thought about playing on Broadway? And I said, well, I thought about it, but I don't really, know how to go about doing it and Gary literally said to me he said well look my student Howard joins I'm going to tell I'm going to tell him about you you call him on Thursday I'm going to see him tomorrow for a lesson you call him Thursday 
and, and I'll tell him about you. And he's doing a show right now. I'll tell him to get you in as a sub. And that's pretty much what happened. Perfect. The story goes on from there, but I won't bore you with all the details. He was playing the King and I, and I went in, I thought I was ready. I was pretty ready, but scared out of my mind. Was. Anyway, somehow I survived that first night. Uh, and then from there, it kind of snowballed. I started playing a little shop of horrors. I was subbing there. Right. Tom Oldekowski used me at Radio City. I played a summer Disney right. show there. Uh, and then I quickly went on the road because someone, one of the contractors called me and offered me a job playing with a show on the road. And, you know, he listed the cities like Milwaukee. And, I was, and that to me sounded really exotic and interesting. Milwaukee. And the money was, you know, yeah, Milwaukee. So, you know, but, and before, while I was doing all this studying in New York, I was also playing a lot of bar mitzvahs and weddings and parties and yeah, you wearing the tuxedo all weekend long and driving from New Jersey to Connecticut to New York. And, you know, I was living in Jersey City and I was schlepping my drums around all the time in and out of the hotels and through the kitchens and a tuxedo and driving the tri-state area. So suddenly somebody calls me with a, a, ostensibly a Broadway show and I don't have to move any drums and they're paying me more than I'm making in town. I was like, yeah, this sounds good. Right, and you're and, single at the time. It sounds like the greatest thing yeah. to do. I started on the road myself, and it's always, you meet people, you, you see Milwaukee, but you see in the rest <laughs> of the country as right. well. Right. It, it's a whole nother life. I mean, it's... I loved it. I really loved it. So I, I wound up doing that. On Your Toes was the show. and that, on that your spilled, toes. Yeah, that was a few months, and then it spilled into Dreamgirls, and I went to Japan. I was playing percussion on Dream Girls, and Japan, and our Dream Girls actually came back to New York, and it was during the time of the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to play five weeks at the Ambassador Theater, and what happened was the show was reviewed. This tour was reviewed, and uh, Frank Rich, who was the all uh, important theater critic, all powerful, gave this version of Dream Girls an incredible review and went on and on about it and talked about Michael Bennett and how Michael Bennett's dying. Anyway, the point of that- A friend of was, Michael Bennett, believe it or not. Wow. He started with a chorus line way back. Oh, right, right, exactly. Be very beginning, so I knew Michael pretty well. So, and uh, for those of you listening, Michael Bennett was the uh, choreographer and a director of A Chorus Line, the, uh, the right. old great show, A Chorus Line. Right, and he was also and the director. Was Director for Dream Girls, yeah. the original Dream Girls. Anyway, so the show got an amazing review, and we wound up instead of doing five weeks, and then going on to with the tour, we wound up doing seven months. And I came up, came off the road after two years with my own Broadway show. Yeah. It was unbelievably lucky. I was playing percussion. That's fantastic. And then after that, I decided, you know what? I don't want to do Broadway anymore. I got involved in a rock band. I was trying to get a record deal, mm. and that nothing happened with that for about a year. And then about a year into it. I got a call from Mel Rodden, who was a prominent contractor at the time, to see if I wanted to go do Cats on the road. And I just bought a new car. So I took my car on the road, went on the road with Cats, loved it, drove around out west. It was fantastic, made a lot of money, saved, I was saving money. I gave up my apartment but, in New Jersey. But you took, was, but weren't, weren't they flying from different places? So you would have to, you had enough time in between cities to yeah. drive to the next town. Yeah, there was a bunch of us in the band that had cars. And then back in those days, if you didn't take the flight, if you opted to not take the company flight, they would reimburse you the cost of the plane fare. So back then, they were flying almost every week or every couple of weeks, and it'd be an extra $300, $400 in my paycheck every week. Nice. I'm thinking, well, the gas is only going to cost me 60 bucks, <laughs> and I love my car, and I don't have to travel with the other 75 people and right. deal with all of, the sh all of that madness, you know, yeah. of being together with 70 people. I was just on my own. I loved it. So I loved it so much that I did a year of Cats, five years of Les Mis, three years of Miss Saigon. I did nine years solid driving around the country. On the road. On the road with my car. The, I mean, I know the Broadway scene very uh, well. A lot of times what happens with these contractors, they know Gary's a guy that could go on the road. He's not at home with his wife and the kids that just had right. babies. So you got to be careful about that stigma about Absolutely. being labeled as only the road musician. And I guess for nine years, you were, I mean, it was great for you in that respect. And I'm sure you saved up a lot of money. But, you know, the stigma that Gary, oh, I got another tour. Let's put Gary on it. Where eventually, I'm sure you wanted to settle back down. 
Right. Well, you know, to be honest, Al, I was having so much fun. In the back of my mind, that was really true. I thought, well, okay, I could do, you know, I was, I was very lucky because I was on these big tours and we were staying in cities, you know, Les Mis and Miss Saigon. We were safe. We'd stay in a, Denver for a month or two months. Right, then sure, we'd go to sure. Seattle and we'd be there for two months. And I always, they had a beautiful apartment, you know, corporate apartment. Right. I was on my own. I was single. Right. It was great. I had my car. I could do what I wanted. I would sit in with musicians. The drag was that I, I knew that I wasn't getting my butt kicked in New York City, which is what I would have been doing, playing music and meeting, doing a lot of networking. I was kind of stuck on the road and doing the same music all the time. That was a bummer. But I had a little electric set. I would practice in the hotel rooms with headphones. But I was saving a lot of money, having a great time. And I was like, you know what? New York will be there. And I got, I was extremely lucky. What happened with me was um, when I decided to come off the road, I mean, frankly, I was so comfortable. I thought, well, maybe I'll do this for a while and then move to Hawaii and get a gig playing in a trio on a boat, you know, and that'd be that. You know, that was what I was thinking. Yeah. But what happened was my dad passed away. And my mom was here in New Jersey. And a few months later, I decided, you know, I better get off the road and see how she's doing. I came here and literally as soon as I got here, because I had worked so many years on the road, people who I'd worked for were now conductors and stuff. And they heard I was in town and I started subbing. I subbed for Ron Zito at Chicago. Yeah. It's like a few weeks after I got here. Right. And that went well. And then Lion King was just opening. And I literally ran into Tommy Igo in a deli. And Tommy said, Gary, you want to learn the show? And I said, I wasn't even going to call you because I know everybody in town is calling you. Yeah. He said, no, I hear great things about you. If you want to learn it, come learn it. So I dropped everything, learned Lion King. And here's how lucky I was at that point. Lion King went really well. Um, and I played, a, you know, I was there for a few months playing, show, playing the show. Joe Church was the conductor, the musical director. Yeah. And one day, unbeknownst to me, Michael Keller, who was the con musical contractor for uh, The Lion King, had, had just been hired to be the contractor for Aida. Unbeknownst to me, Michael Keller calls Joe Church, the conductor, and says to Joe, so I need a drummer. Yeah, who's, who's the best, who's the best, you know, who do you really like over there? That's what he said. And so Joe said, well, this guy Gary Seligson came out of nowhere and was killing it. Well, I get a phone call one day and it's Keller. How would you like to do this? We, you have to go to Atlanta. It's an Elton John Disney show. And I said, well, sure, I'd love to do that, you know. And he said, really, you want to leave town? And I was like, uh, yeah, for this. Anyway, long story short, sure. it became Aida, took six months or longer. And that was a minor hit, pretty good hit. Yeah. And um, it kind of put me on the map. Suddenly I had my own show playing drums. Right, so it was, got you involved with, with a, a, you know, a well-known uh, musical contractor in town. Yes, so right. That, and then Keller hired me for other stuff too. Right, of course. Great. So, so you went out there for a while, then you came back with Aida. Of course, uh, did you also record with Elton John or you, you did the live out, the album for it, the uh, studio album? Right, uh, you're right. The orchestra, you know, the band did the record, the cast album, which was amazing. Uh, I had a little experience playing with Elton John on the Today Show. We did like a promo uh, thing with, with Leanne Rimes, oh, yeah. where we were lucky. He used, he basically used all of us in the band. Um, he used the rhythm section. So it was myself, Gary Bristol, Bruce Huchatel. Right. Um, it was, sure. It was, that, it was really before the New York run started. So he kind of called Keller, I guess, called people who he thought would be doing the run. But Kevin Kuhn is also on that. They needed oh, another yeah. guitar. Sure. Kevin got to do it. Yeah, that's a, that was a nutty story because um, we rehearsed at SIR the night before, and that song was with a gospel choir. Hmm. So at the rehearsal was, was just the rhythm section and the gospel choir. Elton didn't make the rehearsal. Leanne Rimes was not at the rehearsal, but Elton's stuff was there. I was using SIR's drums. The plan was that we would go to the Today Show in the morning, be there at 4.30 in the morning or whatever that crazy time. You get to have to get there really early. So I'm there at 4, 4.30, 5 in the morning. And the plan was Elton's guys were going to move the drums that I used at SIR. Everything was spiked out. There was tape, tape on the floor, you know, tape on the, on the carpet to make sure everything was in the right place, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, I'm in the green room drinking coffee at six in the morning and Elton's MD says to me, Gary, let's just check the drums and make sure everything is cool. We're going to go on in about 15 minutes. 15. So I go downstairs thinking everything is going to be laid out spectacularly perfect like I left it. 
Well, everything was screwed up. It was so screwed up, Al, that, that uh, I couldn't sit at the drum set because the riser that I was on did, didn't go deep enough. So whoever set up the drums had no concept of what spatially needs to happen for someone to play the drums. Yes, yes. So I couldn't play the, you know, I was like, I was on top of the drums like this. I, there was no way for me to physically play. Elton's on the couch talking to Matt Lauer. I'm looking at it over there. Yeah. And they're saying, okay, 12 minutes. I'm thinking, 12 minutes? Right, right. We got to rebuild the riser. Anyway, long story short, <laughs> they got it together in about 15 minutes. It was, it was craziness. Yeah, ready. I was, yeah. I was already frightened to begin with. Like, power, you know, like just scared out of my mind, live TV with Elton John. And then I can't play, I couldn't play. The toms are backwards, the cables were screwed up, the, the seat was so close I couldn't stretch my legs to play the pedals. So they had to find another piece of riser. Quickly they fly that in, there's plants on the riser, these giant potted plants. Guys were hanging lights. They had to get the guy off the ladder who was pointing the lights. They had to get rid of the plants. They had to find another piece of riser. They were amazing. But everybody was blaming me, like, what the hell did you do? You know, why did you do this? Right, right. It's your fault. It's live TV. Live uh, TV. So you went from there. All right, so now you're, now you're in tight with, with Michael Keller, a big uh, contractor in town. And, and, of course, Elton, you got a show. Where would you go from there? Let's uh, okay, so, so it's, a series so, of shows. Or El, you did that for six months or more, you said. And then, well, Aida was, okay, so Aida was about three years. Oh, total. it was three years. Wow, yeah. Yeah. And uh, during the course of that, the, the um, choreographer, Wayne Salento, yes, I know. created a lot of stuff. Um, he was the original, he was one of the original chorus line people, as a matter of right. fact. Right. Uh, anyway, Wayne, Wayne was a choreographer, and there was a lot of dance music that was set up for Aida, which, which had a lot of kind of African and Middle Eastern elements. And they tapped me and Jim Abbott, my good friend Jim Abbott, mm -hmm to kind of come up with these parts. Little did we know the stuff we wrote wound up being the bulk of the dance arrangements for the show. So when you look, you know, I'm actually credited as a dance arranger on That's that, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. Uh, and then, so Wayne, his next project was Wicked. So one day Jim says to me, hey, so Wayne has this thing called Wicked. Are you interested in working on this? I said, oh, sure. And it was just gonna be day work, you know, like pre-production stuff. Nobody had any idea what Wicked would, Wicked would become. Anyway, so we get in the room and we start rehearsing with Wayne and uh, I'm doing Aida at night. And I'm thinking, well, Wicked, is, this is really interesting. I'm enjoying this. And, and Aida's kind of winding down. So what happens next is that they put the show together for Wicked. They, they hire the cast. They do the rehearsals. They were going to do the out-of-town tryout in San Francisco. And Michael Keller, who's a contractor for that, said to me, well, you know, Gary, I don't even know if you want to do this show, but... I have to hire the local guy in San Francisco. They're making me hire the local drummer. So you can't play drums out there even if you wanted to. Mm. I was like, okay, fine. So I had a feeling that Wicked was gonna be something really great. I really did. So I flew out, my, flew myself out to go to San Francisco to see the show. Um, and when I sat in the audience and watched the show and I heard the audience gasping after like the first five minutes. Powerful. Uh, very powerful show. I was like, well, I think I better leave Aida and, and do Wicked. So that's what I did. I left Aida to do Wicked, and Wicked turned out to be a giant hit. Wow. I was so lucky. So you and, took the initiative and said, I, let, me, let me at least go see this thing. Because yeah, I, right. I figured Aida might, you know, we had done three years. I figured Aida might have another year. Right. That, and I, I, Dina Menzel was... Uh, uh, it was Joel Gray, Adina Menzel, Kristen Chenoweth. Right. Robert, Robert Leo Butts. Of their voices are ridiculous. And it was a great cast. It's a really beautiful set. Yeah. The story is great. You know, it, it ties everybody in because it's a prequel to The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Stephen Schwartz's music is great. There's a lot of good things about it. Um, and so you see it's still running. So that was the next thing. I was extremely lucky. So I went from one hit to another. Mm. And then while a few years into that, it was about three years into that when... Jim Abbott told me, well, you know, Disney's working on Tarzan. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Are you interested in doing this? And Phil, I'm a huge Phil Collins fan, like everybody else, or a lot of people. And I thought, well, God, to work, you know. So I started working on that, and I was hoping to get the job. Long, there was a long story with that, and I wound up getting the gig. 
and I left Wicked to do Tarzan. Now that didn't turn out so good in, this, in the terms of the fact that Wicked is still running now, 17 years down the line, and uh, Tarzan opened and closed in about a year and a half or less. But that, that, but once again, that was Michael Keller. It was that Michael's show. Also, Michael Keller. Contract is also a good thing for you know uh, some of our guests sure. to understand. Is so you're going on the lead of also switching, going with the contractor. You're not always guaranteed, but right. you know he's looking after you. You're looking after him. It's a change of pace for you. It's a different. No, I, I can vividly remember Keller, Michael Keller, saying to me, uh, "Gary, you sure you know what you're doing here?" Because Wicked is really strong. It's not going anywhere. Right. And I said, no, 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 I have to do this because Phil Collins is a hero of mine. Right, of course. It was amazing. And I don't regret it. I got to play, you know, talking TV. I got to, there was one, we did You'll Be In My Heart on TV with Phil singing. That was incredible. Right, great, great. Right. Incredible. So Tarzan didn't last as long, but then you, obviously you kept it going from there. Where, where'd you go after that one? Um, okay, so I went, those, that was three, three shows in a row. That was like, I guess, about seven years of work, solid. Then when Tarzan closed, I was really, for 14 months, I was subbing around freelancing. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if I'd get a show again. But then one day, Billy Elliot happened, and Michael Keller called me. There you go. Um, that was really, besides, besides Aida, that was the only time he really called me. The other shows that I did... I got in through Jim Abbott somehow or through the conductor or, or some of the composer, you know, the dancer, the choreographer. So it was not always Michael Keller, although he's been great to me. Anyway, Billy Elliott ran for about three and a half years. It was amazing. Right. Elton John music, although a lot of it doesn't sound like Elton to me. Yeah, a little bit of uh, past stuff, of course, you know, Superstar and, and Aida and uh, a lot of those. And uh, what's the other one? Uh, his main one. Vita was... Um, Phantom of the Opera, which I never did. Oh, yeah. Cats. Yeah. Cats. Yeah. Well, School of Rock was Andrew Lord. Oh, Andrew Lord. Oh, we're talking about Elton John. I'm sorry. <laughs> After a while, oh. they all become a blur. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Elton John's Lion King, Billy Elliot, Aida. Right, right. But also his first, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Joseph is Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh, right, right. I'm going back and forth. You know, the, the two of them uh, become a blur because they both done so many great shows. You know, they, they both just have a, such a history of, of shows. So then, all right, so now you have Billy Elliot, which, which uh, lasted a while. So back with uh, Elton, right? Uh, yeah, although he was never there. He never, he, I never, he had nothing to do with the show as far as, New York was concerned that I knew of. I mean, he, you know, at Aida, I will say that there was a couple times where Elton came into the rehearsal room in the early days okay. um, to listen to stuff. And he definitely, I remember him being in a preview in New York. Uh, and I remember him being in Atlanta. Uh, Elton never with Billy Elliot in New York at that point in his life, I don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't interested in Billy Elliot in New York as far as I knew, although the show was great. Yeah. You know, it's an amazing show. The three kids, it was, they had these dan these kid dancers that were astounding, and the show is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so let's keep it moving because uh, I don't yeah, want to. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Take your time. And then from there, you went into. Uh... Right. Billy Elliot, Billy Elliot ended, and then I had another 14 months off where I was subbing around. And then I got called for Motown, um, and I played percussion on Motown, like the tambourine timpani vibe book, which was great fun. Uh -huh. Really switched gears. I had to relearn how to play vi how to play mallets. It yeah. had been a while, you know, Terrific. but it was it was good. It wasn't too taxing for me. I got my tambourine, gospel tambourine thing together, which is great. Oh. Uh, and then that was about a year plus. And then um, School of Rock happened right on the tail end of that. Right. Okay. So School of Rock, it it ended right. I mean, a little while ago. School of Rock, yeah. School of Rock closed January of two thousand nineteen. Oh, okay. And so, so that was April, that was a giant, a long, long run, was it? We uh, three years again, another three years. Wow. So yeah, I, you know, I, I want to say that I, for whatever reason, I've been extremely fortunate because a lot the shows, most of the shows that I've gotten attached to, have become big hits. Yeah. Or became big hits. It's not a, as you know, Alan. It's not unusual for a show to run a couple of months or six months or a year, maybe even a year is a good run. I've had three 
or four, I think, that were pretty much longer than a year, certainly. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I've been really lucky, really, really lucky. I've had long runs. That's and, good. I, and, and of course, it's all union for our, our audience. It's all union and, of course, uh, pension. The pension's great, except for they, they cut our pension this year. Right. Yeah, it's, I, I think we're in trouble with that for sure. So, great. Yeah. All right. So, so wh where are you now? Let's, let's get to where you are now, what you're doing now, and how, because you are a live player, you played a lot of Broadway, how is, the, the, you know, the situation we're in right now really affecting you personally? And what do you think about live audience? When is the next time they're going to open a theater for that many people again, you know? So. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty, you know, well, let's, I guess, when this, when the virus took hold, um, I had just started playing percussion at Mrs. Doubtfire, the musical. Um, which I think, based on the movie, which I think is a really great show. It has a lot of heart. I think it has a lot of, I think it's very powerful and really well done. The guy that's playing Robin Williams' role, Rob McClure, is excellent. And the show's written really well. It's directed well. I think it has a lot of power. We, we got through three previews and then they shut down Broadway on March 12th. So now it's April, I don't know, 20 something. Um, so obviously nothing's happening on Broadway for, for a while. I, I think uh, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking maybe January of 2021, perhaps. Mm. I, I can't help but think that people are spooked. Sure. To, you know, who wants to come to Times Square and be in the middle of all that? And also how are they going to 50% of capacity for the theater? Or what right. they if they do that, then they can't afford to have the show. So it's going to be a long time. It's crazy, man. I don't have any delusions about that. I think it's. I think we're in it for a long wait here. Um, and who knows if, if at that time they'll still have, if they wanted to produce the show. Everything is very much up in the air, you know? Uh, well, it's a whole so, domino series. I mean, you, you, yes. know, you can't play the show, but really the show, the theater industry, the show business right. is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are out of work from all this. That, that we don't see an end to. So really, that's, that's kind of where I wanted to finally get to. So right now, obviously, you have your own studio there. You could do tracks for people. I'm sure you say you're still teaching online somewhat. Yep. Uh, well, I'm going to wrap that up, actually. Yeah. Uh, I have taught in and out for years. It seems like when I have a show, it was hard for me to teach because I would have to leave, my, you know, if, if I'm teaching kids, um, like high school, college, uh, high school, middle school kids, by the time they get to my studio, it's about 3.30, 3.45. And if I'm going to work, if it's a seven o'clock show, I need to be on a train at 4.30, basically. So I could get a lesson. And so basically it seems a little futile um, unless I take a day off to teach. And, I, I, you know, frankly, I was busy enough working that it, I didn't feel like the need to the pull to teach so much. However, now it's a different situation. I have this great space here and I can absolutely do it online. I'm starting to do it more. To be honest with you, I think that's where my where my game plan is now. I'm a father. I have two, you know, married. I have two kids. My kids are high school and middle school, so I have a ways to go. Yeah, he, <laughs> you know, the fact that the Broadway show is closed and I don't have an income isn't going to help things. So, yeah, yeah. I plan, I plan on you know I plan on making a go of it for, and I like I do like to teach. I think I have a lot to offer. Yeah. So. I, I mean, what a career you, you've had, and we're able to go. And I know each one of these shows are, are different styles, so yeah. being very versatile is what you could bring to all your students of how to really adapt, how to be able to read. It, and and a lot of people don't realize it's hard playing the same show every night. So people say, "Oh, it gets boring," but really, yeah. you have to be right on every night, like yeah. it's, like it's the main recording of it. So there. Yeah. There's so much uh, talent and, and uh, concentration to make what you do so, uh, you know, accurate every night. When yeah, there's not, there's really not too much wiggle room. Right. You know, there's a little bit. And I will say, depending on the style of the music, I will say like at School of Rock, yeah. the, the music at School of Rock, it was a six piece rock band, three guitars, two keyboards or no, one key, two key, yeah, two keyboards, bass, drums. So there was a lot of room, you know, because the music is not, so I, as a drummer, I could play a different fill in that show. 
right, something like right. Billy Elliot, not that much room. It's a bigger band. Wicked, hardly any room, you know. Right. So, but, but I will say, you know, I think Jack Phil now. In. You know, it's it's not a free thing, like like you not said. at all, no, no, no. Right. no. And yeah. I think a lot of a lot of it is really attitude and being in the moment. You know, you have to be up for it. You, uh, I couldn't. I think one of the reasons I've been successful uh, isn't because I'm the greatest drummer in the world. I really think it has to do with attitude and just you know, really being really being aware of what's going, on, staying aware, and making people feel comfortable, whether it's the conductor or the band. You know, I'm aware of the singers and the show. I mean, it's part of the job for sure, a big part of the job. And maybe not everybody realizes that. And it, yeah, you know, I, I learned it a long time ago that that the show has to be really recreated every night. So if it's a dance sequence that, that lasts for a hundred bars, if I'm just checked out at the beginning, middle, or end of that, these poor people on stage dancing their hearts out, you know. It's dangerous and everything else. If a drummer sounds lazy or not in it, you know, there's a lot of responsibility. I, it's not to me that different than driving a bunch of kids in a carpool or something like I have to pay attention to the lights, the stop signs, who's crossing the street, what, you know, what everything. I never, I never compared, uh, thought of comparing playing <laughs> To, to driving to be that careful but you as the drummer of course that's the main part of the locomotive right yeah, you gotta get from point a to point b with all these people you know right the engine you're really holding down the, the engine of that that whole uh production so uh, let, let's try to just wrap it up so sure. you're, you're teaching now obviously you're doing online stuff so where do you see the industry going for a little while and where do you see yourself and then of course a little bit of inspiration, uh, you know, you know, okay. um, people listening to you. Man, I think it's a whole new world. I, I really do. I, I don't know if we know what, what it's going to be like. I, I do think that I think we'll come out of this and I think people will be really excited to hear live music and live theater. Uh, and I, and I, um, so I think when we come out of it, I think there will be a massive resurgence and a welcoming from people who want to spend money who feel safe going to the venue to, to do that you know safety is a huge thing so it might be a while it's but i feel like i can i can just in my brain hear the crowd you know people applauding and being wildly happy that like like back to normal life again you know and i think so that's one thing i'm thinking about and the other thing is uh, i do think this time now people with everybody um being in quarantine i think music People are rediscovering music. I know I am a little bit. Um, I think it's, it's you know, it, for me as a musician who works all the time, if it's on, if it's Mrs. Doubtfire that I'm going into work to play, or if it's a PDF and some something recorded that somebody sent to me that I need to, to record, or have a rehearsal with, for this singer songwriter, I always have, there's always something on my plate that I'm listening to day to day that I have to listen to because it's my job. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't have that opportunity to listen to that stuff. So I find myself listening to music and all of a sudden choosing like what I want to listen to. I have more opportunity to do that. And I'm hearing music in a way that I haven't heard in a while. Right, maybe, maybe been, some jazz records or- uh, Yeah, all, all kinds of things. It's been, really, it's been really interesting the way, I, the way music is hitting me uh, it's kind of reignited me in a little way. And plus, I have a lot of downtime. I'm practicing more. I'm, I'm still learning things I'm, in my studio. I'm getting better Pro Tools. Uh, you know, all kinds of things, you know, that I'm working on here. So I'm never, I don't feel like I'm bored at all. And to get back to your question, I think, you know, I think that's going to be good for the music industry because I think I'm not the only one who feels positive, the positive vibes to be hippie-ish about it. Okay. About music, you know, I think there's a lot of good there. Terrific. So uh, a closing statement. First of all, I, just, I want, really want to thank you for uh, coming on, sure. taking your time to be with us, showing us your studio there and, and your career on Broadway. You're a veteran Broadway musician, veteran drummer. So you really have a longevity in the industry and you played some of the greatest shows on Broadway and, and really uh, originated the drum parts because as, as being the first chair of these shows, you're really, um, you know, your creativity, even though you're reading charts, really outlines what all the other drum, drummers, the way the show 
uh, gets developed. And so you're really the backbone of that. And, and the other thing I just want to say, uh, of course, you said working with the conductors, the contractors, also being a guy like yourself who has so much positive energy that, that you know, these people want to work with you. You know, like you said, there could be a lot of really great drummers, but every orchestra, every band needs a chemistry. So you're bringing a, such positive chemistry to oh, the- Thank you, Alan. That's, that's nice of you, man. And it, re it really shows, you know, for, otherwise you wouldn't have been in the situation. And, and, you know, jumping from one to the other really shows that. So I, I want to, you know- I appreciate that very much, man. Uh, and, and respect for that. And, and that's what the Broadway scene is, you know, of a com camaraderie and how people work well together because you're there every day, all day long, eight shows a week, et cetera, and, and everything else. So I just want to say your career is outstanding. You did a great job. Your music's fantastic, your musicality, your talent. And just give us a closing statement so we have a little uh, positive <laughs> energy on your last sentence here. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, um, I, for myself, I never really knew what I wanted to do. I knew I loved music. I knew, uh, you know, music drumming especially really struck a chord with me. And I went with my heart. And someone once said to me, um, somebody I worked with, a director, said, you know, I always tell my students, this is what she said, that if I'm teaching a class, and the kids are thinking, the college kids thinking about becoming professional actors or not. Her line was, and it's Hillary Adams, I'll quote her. She said, you know, if you can think of, if you can picture yourself doing something else besides music or the art, theater, actor, then maybe, maybe, maybe this is not the thing for you. Right. But if you, if it's so, if it's, if the will is so strong in you, you have that kind of passion and, and you feel like, this is really all you want to do. You don't really have a choice. If you feel like that, then maybe, maybe then, then it's not a bad idea. Right, right. And then you have to hope that then you have, then it's up to you to train really well, you know, bring a great attitude and all of those things that, you, that we all know about. Um, but I'd say if I was talking to kids and you know what the future, my advice would be, if you feel that strongly, I think it's, I think you need to go for it because you're not going to be, happy unless you do go for it, you know? And then if it doesn't work out, then you can still switch gears. But for, I can tell you personally, for me, there was, you know, my, my dad would say, don't you think you need a teaching degree? And I'd be like, well, if I study all that stuff, then I'm not putting time into practicing X, Y, Z. Which in my heart, I knew was, was BS because I was like, that's not really true. <laughs> but, you know, I did feel that way in some ways. It just seemed right. So my, I guess my words of advice is stick with it. You know, give it a give it the good fight, and I think you'll be able to put the. You know, I think it's possible to put pen to paper and make it happen. You know, great, great, Gary. I want to thank you again. Really, really terrific uh, insight to to the the whole Broadway scene and and, and all that. So cool. really, I, I want uh, to say, you know, of course, be safe with your family. All Too the well. thank you. On the other side, we'll all get out well, and uh, yeah, I hope so. Hopefully, I'm everybody. sure. I'm sure. It'll just be a little while. <laughs> all right, Gary. Thank you so much. It's been a thank pleasure. You, Alan. Okay, I'm Alan Cohen, and this was the quarantine interview. Thank you. <laughs>